Mythbusters taught us a lot about how the world works, but how much do you know about how the show worked? From the personal lives of the crew to the production stories you never knew about, this behind-the-scenes breakdown has all the info you'll ever need. Jamie Heineman was always the quieter, more reserved half of the Mythbusters team, while Adam Savage was arguably the more charismatic of the two. But although Jamie might have appeared pretty low-key on the show, there's been a lot more going on for him off-camera. Surprise, Heinemann was once an unruly, underage hooligan. Faced with the prospect of reform school, a 14-year-old Heinemann ran away from home and set off on a six-month hitchhiking adventure. When I left home, I had $1.49 in my pocket. It was just enough for me to get a slice of pizza. According to the Christian Science Monitor, the fun ended in California when he got tossed into a juvenile detention center, where his parents later picked him up. It was great. I had a great time. Just before graduating high school, Heinemann's dad convinced him to buy an actual pet shop. Don't touch that! You bond with it, you buy it! According to Keith Zimmerman's Mythbusters tell-all, Jamie bought the shop and sold rodents, birds, and animal food. Little boys love snakes. Through the business, he obtained several pet snakes, as well as a lion cub, which he raised on his parents' apple farm. But Heinemann eventually sold the pet shop so he could go to college. So what skills do you need to become a Mythbuster? Well, if you're Heinemann, a degree in Russian language and literature. According to Indiana University, Heinemann has, quote, exploded any myth that studying the humanities will not lead to an exciting and successful career. That may be true, but why Russian? I must break you. Jamie just needed to pick a language for his bachelor's degree, and he liked the sound of it. After college, Heinemann moved to the Caribbean, where he bought a boat, became a dive master, and opened a charter business, according to Mental Floss. Heinemann also met his wife, who was a diving instructor in the Virgin Islands, while running the charter business. But as Zimmerman wrote, after 3,000 dives and two hurricanes, Jamie finally got sick of scrubbing the bottom of his boat and decided to sail it to New York. This one's busted. It's gotta be. All right, let's go get some fish and chips. Sounds good. Mythbusters is a show about two guys living in the Bay Area who build stuff together and bicker like an old married couple. So it's not too surprising that some viewers got the wrong idea about their relationship. Shall we put some of this chaos to work? Sounds tasty. Even Discovery Channel made some assumptions. Adam Savage told The Sneeze, Among themselves, the network wondered if they could do a show with a couple of homosexuals from San Francisco. Fans even wondered about it too. Heinemann told The Age, we got a lot of gay fan mail when the show first started. Something to do with being in San Francisco and being a big, burly guy with a big mustache. But we're both happily married to women. Adam, we happy? Yeah, we happy. Heinemann is best known for Mythbusters, and like it or not, Mythbusters will probably remain his legacy. Am I emotional about the end of the show? Well, yeah, I suppose I am a little bit. We've done some amazing things over all those years. But he's a man of many interests. According to Gadgetopia, Heinemann's M5 Industries even built a soda can chucking machine that was featured in a 7-Up commercial. To make it more convenient for people to enjoy the refreshing taste of 7-Up, I make vending machines that find you. Jamie told The Star, They asked me if I could invent a vending machine that would spit cans out on demand. I told them for the right price, I could invent a vending machine that would send cans into orbit. Hey, cool. Out of all the members of the Mythbusters build team, Grant Imahara was arguably the most capable at building stuff. Plus, the man has loads of connections to major motion pictures and tons of experience crafting combat robots. In 2010, Grant Imahara promised to build a part of television history, and then he followed through on that promise. It all began, as such things often do, on Twitter. According to Entertainment Weekly, Imahara had noticed that Craig Ferguson, the former host of The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, had taken to calling his Twitter followers his, quote, robot skeleton army. One thing quickly led to another. As Imahara told the Star Advertiser, So at some point, they put two and two together and said, he should have a robot skeleton sidekick. Imahara would prove to be just the man to build it, but there was a catch. The talk show host had to drive Imahara's Twitter followers over the magic line of 100,000. Ferguson quickly rose to the challenge. According to Popular Mechanics, Imahara found his part of the deal considerably more difficult to deliver. He tinkered with the robot while shooting Mythbusters, which meant precious little time for sleep and a huge rush to get everything done in time. Popular Mechanics reports that Imahara soon found himself in something of a bind, with only one week before the deadline, 
he still needed to write the software that would make Jeff move and build Ferguson's control box. Despite his struggles with the project, Imahara managed to deliver on his promise big time. Oh, that's cold, Craig. The end result was Jeff Peterson, a snarky remote-controlled skeleton. The creation became so popular it even has its own Wikipedia entry, and ironically, that entry is significantly longer than Imahara's. It's our, it's our first day together, so you know we're kind of, kind of working out the kinks, right Jeff? Boy, no, not! Ferguson absolutely loved Jeff Peterson, and shortly after Ferguson left The Late Late Show in 2014, Imahara took to Twitter to give fans a much-needed update on everyone's favorite robot skeleton sidekick. For everyone who's asked me what happened to Jeff, I can report that he is safely with Craig in his personal office. And no wonder. Oh, 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 you're the man, Craig. If you're in the business of building robots, you probably have to brace yourself for constant jokes along the lines of, your creation is going to kill you. Well, Grant Imahara might not find those jokes particularly funny, he was, in fact, almost killed by his own robot. Several times, actually. According to Make Magazine, the robot in question was appropriately named The Spider. It was a huge, 625-pound walking machine that Imahara built to be strong enough to carry a man. The Spider didn't exactly come alive and try to kill its creator. It didn't need to. Imahara unintentionally created optimal conditions for a full-fledged sci-fi nightmare. The robot was a particularly challenging and complex one to design and develop, and Imahara made the mistake of testing the spider late at night and all alone. Here's how that played out. Woo! And apparently that's not the only time the robot could have seriously hurt or even killed Imahara. As he told Make Magazine, Working late at night by myself, there were a few too close calls when the robot almost crushed me. Pro tip, don't do what I did. Never work alone around heavy or otherwise dangerous equipment. According to his profile at the USC Alumni Association, Grant Imahara spent nine years working at Industrial Light & Magic, the special effects company founded in 1975 by George Lucas. And during that time, he got to work on some truly fantastic franchises. We'll get to Imahara's wide-ranging work on the Star Wars prequels in a hot minute, but first, you should know that he also built models for The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions. According to Mauser, he also got to work behind the scenes on films as varied as The Lost World, Jurassic Park, Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, and AI Artificial Intelligence, to name just a few. As the saying goes, it's all about the friends you make along the way. During the time with Industrial Light and Magic, Imahara got to know two other ambitious model makers, Tori Bellacci and Adam Savage. Grant Imahara isn't the only Mythbuster to work on the Star Wars franchise. As tested reports, both Adam Savage and Tori Bellacci have built models for the movies, but Imahara's contributions are truly impressive. According to Mauser, Imahara is the guy who brought R2-D2 up to date for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, and Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones. From speed controls to radio gear, he replaced R2-D2's inner workings with modern technology. The most visible change? Imahara designed a new system for the droid's light displays. He removed the old rotating color wheel lit with halogen light and replaced it with a custom LED rig that, strangely enough, wasn't specifically designed for R2-D2. It was actually created out of a gadget from the main engines of the Protector, the spaceship in Galaxy Quest. We don't really know which one. What's more, Mauser reports that Imahara was one of three official R2-D2 operators in the United States. Sounds like quite the responsibility, right? Well, as he told Nerd Alert, Driving R2 is fairly simple. Um, there's one joystick, the right thumb controls the body. Wondering about the left thumb? Imahara goes on to reveal. The left thumb controls the little hollow eye, so you don't have to do that very often. Pretty impressive credentials, no? It's uh, on your resume. It's on my resume. <laughs> and that's not all. According to Wired, Imahara spent a decade as something of an official backup C-3PO, wearing the golden suit for assorted appearances, including a memorable Oprah segment. I'm here with some of the most popular Star Wars characters, C-3PO! 
Grand Imahara is one of the many mines behind the iconic Energizer bunny. In 2011, AL.com reported that the Energizer company fell out with the original designers of the mascot and needed to find someone to build new bunnies. Imahara turned out to be just the man for the job. Mauser reports that Imahara personally built the circuit that enables the bunny's famous ear movements and beating arms. He also installed and programmed all the electronics for the bunnies during his tenure with the project. Imahara has shared some deep, dark secrets about the sprightly battery mascot. Despite appearing rather small in the commercials, the bunny is actually about two feet tall, and it's filled to the brim with electronics. It actually takes a whopping 44 AA batteries to get them working. And yes, Imahara assures us they're all Energizer batteries, so you can sleep easy tonight. It apparently took a team of three people just to keep the arms operating like they're supposed to. Imahara's crew built three bunnies, named Earl, Floyd, and Garth. They must have cost the company a pretty penny, as Imahara told AL.com, I can't tell you how much they cost, but if you know what a Ferrari Testarossa costs, each bunny costs that much. And believe us when we tell you, that's the final word on the subject. The name Tomlinson Holman might not mean much to you unless you're an audio buff, but for Grant Imahara, it means the world. According to the USC Alumni Association, Imahara was struggling with his engineering studies, to say the least. As he told Twit Tech Podcast Network, I'm falling asleep in my classes. I don't have focus. This, this sucks. A counselor reportedly told Imahara to meet with Holman, who was a professor of cinematic arts and also the man who developed the revolutionary THX sound system. You know the one. Imahara was instantly starstruck and offered his services as Holman's unpaid personal assistant. Holman accepted, and Imahara spent an extremely eye-opening year working under him. Holman's innovations at THX helped renew Imahara's passion for engineering by teaching him creative ways to apply his talents. Then, Holman scored the young man an internship at the company, which turned into a full-time job after Imahara finished his studies. And finally, after three years with THX, Imahara got an even more alluring job with another well-known Lucasfilm company, Industrial Light & Magic. The rest, as they say, is history. Because of Mythbusters' widespread love and popularity, a lot of people probably think they know all the secrets behind this explosively entertaining show. That would be a myth, though. Before appearing in Mythbusters, Carrie Byron was a student of film and culture at San Francisco State University, and she ultimately wanted to join the special effects industry. That interest eventually led her to M5, the FX company founded by fellow Mythbuster Jamie Heineman. She was actually an unpaid intern for a while, and that opportunity eventually blossomed into a job offer to join Mythbusters. Everybody loves an intern. They work hard, they're trying to prove themselves, and they are cheap or free but she never lost her artistic streak. If anything, she learned to marry the more explosive elements of the show into her own artistic expression. One very clear example of this is her explosive paintings. To create these works, she lights gunpowder on fire and then scrapes burnt clay away from the page to make a series of haunting images. She likens the process to, quote, controlled chaos. Exploding pants, killer whirlpools. Have you ever really looked at the sky? <laughs> With so many experiments over the years, you have to wonder if there are any myths the group regrets having busted. Adam Savage apparently wishes he'd ixnayed one segment. Not because the experiment was particularly dangerous or difficult to film, but because it involved magic. At least, that's how Savage sees it. The experiment itself involved determining whether or not keeping a shaving razor beneath a makeshift pyramid would actually keep it sharper due to so-called pyramid power. Savage regrets filming the segment because he believes it was ultimately impossible to apply the scientific method to that particular experiment. He believes that they were tasked with, quote, trying to prove a negative, since there was no real way to measure success or failure. Mythbusters was all about science, which means it never let something like corporate sponsorship get in the way of truth, right? Alas, it sounds like even Mythbusters wasn't immune to advertiser pressure. They reportedly decided to axe an entire episode about RFID, that handy technology that lets you wave your credit card in front of a card reader so you don't have to swipe it. You've no doubt heard that RFID isn't necessarily secure. Well, Mythbusters got wind of that too and planned an entire episode about the hackability of the technology. But according to the Register, lawyers for major credit card companies intervened and the episode never saw the light of day. In 2008, Adam Savage opened up about the situation at a Hackers on Planet Earth conference. They absolutely made it really clear to Discovery that they were not going to air this episode talking about how hackable this stuff was. 
He claimed Discovery, quote, backed down because they relied so heavily upon advertising revenue. That sounds like the honest truth, but something must have happened behind the scenes. Savage later backtracked and changed his tune, saying, The decision was made by our production company and had nothing to do with Discovery. Whatever you say, Adam. Mythbusters was billed as a family show, so there were certain things the program simply wasn't allowed to do. For example, they couldn't even show a simulation of a particular body part while testing the legendary peeing on the third rail myth, even though they were clearly using a synthetic tube. Oh, and in case you're wondering how that experiment worked out... One... Anyway, according to TV Tropes, censors forbade Mythbusters from airing an entire episode about farting. Knock yourself out. Undeterred, the team tried a segment on farting later on, but this time they followed all sorts of oddball rules, like only using the word flatus instead of fart, supposedly to make the whole thing sound more scientific. To work around all the bodily functions they couldn't show on screen, the Mythbusters team built a fart machine. I am planning to build a machine that can also eject a flatus. That's what all this equipment is. The result was really funny and actually rather vulgar, even though they were basically using a whoopee cushion. Mythbusters was a geeky show. You can gloss over that fact as much as you like, but pretty much every cast member was unabashedly geeky. And if you watched the show, you were pretty geeky too. And what's the holy grail of geekdom? But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Star Wars, obviously. As you can imagine, it's not particularly easy to work something like Star Wars into your myth-busting franchise. After all, Star Wars is a closely guarded property, and there are hoops to be jumped through before you can start busting lightsaber and stormtrooper myths. Adam Savage told The Hollywood Reporter he was surprised how open Lucasfilm turned out to be with their permissions. The team wasn't allowed to animate lightsaber effects, but other than that, they were pretty much given free reign. There was one important provision. Savage joked that Mythbusters couldn't depict stormtroopers shaking their moneymakers. He told The Hollywood Reporter, I don't think they wanted us to twerk with a stormtrooper or something like that. Makes sense, the Lucasfilm people probably didn't want another Christmas special on their hands. Please, please, I have enough aggravation. Fault I can lie anyway. The Mythbusters had some very public mishaps, but people might not entirely realize just how common it was for the cast to injure themselves in the line of duty. According to CNET, Mythbuster accidents ran the gamut, from explosions to an injury by goat. In fact, Adam Savage once said the show was, quote, four minutes of science and ten minutes of me hurting myself. He holds his breath, tugs on the door, pushes his whole weight against it, but nothing happens. In one infamous experiment, the team wanted to find out if an explosion could actually knock the socks off a mannequin. The explosion wound up shattering the windows of a nearby home. Ironically, the blast quite literally knocked a woman off her couch. Sort of like knocking the socks off a mannequin, but not really. Co-host Tori Belechi's on-set accidents included getting kicked in the crotch by a goat and spectacularly wiping out while trying to jump over a red wagon on a bicycle. I'm okay. Savage was the recipient of one of the show's more serious injuries. He once broke his hand on a blast chamber. Surprisingly, most of the injuries on the show were fairly minor, just stitches and broken fingers. Not bad for a show with a premise that's firmly grounded in blowing stuff up. Hopefully, the safety experts were well compensated. No one deserved that paycheck more. Mythbusters is real science, not mad science. It's not like they ever received orders to build a death ray or something. Except that time President Obama quite literally gave them orders to build a death ray. Mythbusters is about is testing out various hypotheses, and I think that we've got a big one that hasn't been thoroughly tested. Which one is that? Well, it is Archimedes' solar ray. In a 2011 lecture, Savage said he'd never met anyone with as much charisma as Obama. Then Obama walks in and immediately releases all the tension. I've never seen anything like it. He walked in, he introduced himself to us, he shook hands with the crew. The former president goes on to gently admonish Savage and Jamie Heineman for failing to thoroughly test the solar ray back in 2006, when they first attempted to create it. The likely mythical device dates all the way back to the second century, and it was designed to ignite the sails of enemy ships with highly focused mirrors. The team recruited 500 people with mirrors to retry the experiment. Once again, they failed to prove the concept. According to Gizmodo, the president's appearance on Mythbusters was actually part of a White House initiative to get kids more interested in science. And let's face it, a death ray is the perfect gateway drug to the world of physics and beyond. You probably know Tori Belechi from Mythbusters, but the popular show isn't the only feather in his cap. 
He was cooking up awesome stuff long before he became a familiar face, and he's kept super busy ever since leaving the myth-busting biz. It's a career path that certainly befits a man who's famous for blowing things up. Tori Bellacci worked in special effects for quite a long time before becoming a TV star. In fact, he contributed to the god king of all geek franchises, Star Wars. Bellacci's online portfolio is chock full of photos featuring him painstakingly building models of the massive Federation battleship and one of the pod racers for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. And he worked closely with one of his future Mythbusters cohorts at Industrial Light and Magic, the special effects company founded by George Lucas in 1975. In the past, Belechi's former colleague Adam Savage has talked about their work together on a particularly difficult set piece, Tipoka City from Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones. That's where Obi-Wan Kenobi and Jango Fett fought each other, in case you haven't checked out the film recently. Savage even posted a photograph to his website Tested, which features them both dutifully building a Topoka City model, although he reveals the image isn't quite what it appears to be, writing that, The photo of Tori and me is actually one we call a model shop reach. These models are completely done, yet it looks like Tori and I are still model making with tools. In reality, we were asked by the ILM photographer to come back over to the set and make it look briefly like we were working on the models. That's show business for you. It's hard to imagine a show with a more absurd premise than Mythbusters, which revolved around quite literally exploding myths and urban legends. Well, leave it to Tori Belechi to find a way to top it. Busters Tori Belechi hosts the ultimate heavy metal showdown. According to Wired, the myth-busting rascal found himself hosting a show called Flying Anvils in 2011. The entire premise involved contestants shooting anvils flying into the sky using controlled black powder explosions. Believe it or not, this wasn't a concept hatched by some caffeinated TV executive. Belechi was a celebrity host for the National Anvil Shooting Championship, an actual sport that Belechi says dates back 200 years. There's a lot of rules, but there's only one that matters. Make sure you're not in the wrong place when the anvil lands. If you think blasting 100-pound anvils 200 feet into the air sounds dangerous, Belechi would certainly agree with you. But in his interview with Wired, he says of the contestants, These people are the salt of the earth. They're very normal people. At first, I thought they might be super weird, but they're just so down to earth, just typical Americans. A lot of them were blacksmiths to begin with, and that's how they got into it. They take it so seriously. In 2014, Tori Belechi indulged in one of the oddest wrinkles in his professional career. According to The Verge, he took part in the famed Gumball 3000, a highly exclusive and elaborate 3,000-mile street rally, and he did it with Canadian DJ Deadmau5, of all people. Belechi and Deadmau5 drove a Ferrari, a custom Ferrari 458 Italia, with a paint job named after the Nian cat meme and it came complete with speakers that blared its maddening theme song. In fact, Belechi and Deadmau5 say they spent the race listening to that song on repeat. Of all the memes on the internet, why this one? Uh, well, it's a bit dated, because um, well, actually a friend of mine kind of invented it. Although this might seem like a strange celebrity stunt to you, after all, this was the same year Deadmau5 had a new album out, and Belechi and the rest of the build team lost their Mythbusters jobs. But Deadmau5 and Belechi clearly enjoyed their time on the road. They did suffer the occasional setback, however. At one point, the French police banned Deadmau5 from driving in the country, so Belechi had to take the wheel until they reached Spain. Nevertheless, they did rather well on the week-long supercar race. In fact, when they reached the goal in Ibiza, they were awarded the biggest award, the Spirit of Gumball Prize, which is given to the team that was the most positive, had the best time, and partied the hardest. We've told you that Tori Belechi worked for years as a special effects guy, but we need to emphasize just how sought after he was in the field. Judging by his bio and work portfolio, Belechi was one of the best in his biz, thanks in no small part to his nearly decade-long stint at Industrial Light and Magic. In fact, he's worked behind the scenes on some of the most beloved franchises out there. 
Apart from his aforementioned work on Star Wars, he's built models for several movies in the Matrix trilogy, specifically The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions. In fact, here he is working on a control tower in Zion, the last human city on Earth. As a model builder, his resume also includes Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines, Starship Troopers, and Galaxy Quest, as well as work on Van Helsing and the 2003 version of Peter Pan. But he's worked in plenty of other corners of Hollywood as well. For instance, he was a set designer for 2002's Scooby-Doo movie and worked on props for Bicentennial Man. And all this work was before we got to know him through his Mythbusters gig. Quite the impressive work ethic. These days, Belechi is best known as a TV personality, but he's also dabbled on the other side of the camera, and we're not just talking about his special effects either. It turns out Belechi also wrote and directed a short sci-fi movie while studying at San Francisco State University's film school. The film is called Sand Trooper, and it's a post-apocalyptic adventure that he made as his senior thesis. He's so proud of the film, it's even included in the biography on his website, which mentions that, Sand Trooper played at the Slam Dance Film Festival and also aired on Sci-Fi Channel. The short, which credits him with his full name, Salvatore Belechi, takes place in a post-apocalyptic desert where a lone soldier tries to infiltrate a mysterious facility. We have to admit that the special effects, while rudimentary, are pretty darn neat. We won't spoil anything here, but if you ever find yourself in a Mad Max-inspired wasteland, it's probably best to avoid petting mysterious mice. Oh wait, we kind of did spoil that, huh? Since leaving the show, Tori Belechi has somewhat struggled to replicate the success of Mythbusters. His first post-Mythbusters show was Thrill Factor, where he and Carrie Byron took their scientific approach to amusement park rides. Sadly, the show only received a single season in 2015. But at least it fared better than their proposed science-themed prank show, Frankenstein. Alas, Frankenstein was never picked up, although Byron is reportedly still holding out hope. White Rabbit Project, the build team's most recent effort, wasn't too lucky either. In 2017, Belechi confirmed on Reddit that Netflix had chosen against renewing the show for a second season, leading one fan to comment, Tell Netflix I hate them, please and thank you. Another ill-fated show was Punkin' Chunkin', a pumpkin destruction-themed Science Channel Thanksgiving special that Belechi co-hosted for several years. According to CNN, the show is incredibly popular, even topping ratings monsters like The Apprentice. But thanks to the obvious safety risks involved in shooting large pumpkins 4,000 feet into the air, the production was plagued by several injuries. Due to a lawsuit by a volunteer who got injured in an ATV accident, the event was canceled in both 2014 and 2015. And just as they were gearing up to return in 2016, a producer almost died when an air cannon exploded. Clearly, fans of the event were disappointed with this development. As far as, I'm, you know, they should be able to continue going on with it, you know, just to let people know, hey, actions do happen. According to Entertainment Weekly, Tori Belechi and Grant Imahara ended up in the middle of Los Angeles' LAX airport when a gunman terrifyingly opened fire inside Terminal 3 in 2013. Their trip to Science Channel's annual Pumpkin Chunkin' competition in Delaware soon turned into a full-on panic as they ended up right in the thick of things. Belechi told Entertainment Weekly, It was like my worst nightmare. You hear about these situations on the news, but to actually see it, to see people running, leaving stuff behind, crawling over each other, crying, you always wonder how you'll respond. Belechi was reportedly at a gate that was dangerously close to the shooter, and everyone was running his way when the first shot rang out. What's more, there seemed to be nowhere to go, as he told CNN. We were kind of trapped at the end of the terminal. Now, I never saw the shooter, but we heard the shot. Eventually, someone opened the doors and let them out on the tarmac. Belechi and Imahara's live tweets were some of the first reports of the incident to emerge from the scene, with Belechi writing, Shooters in LAX. That was terrifying. Religion doesn't seem to go hand in hand with all the mad scientist antics on Mythbusters, but Tori Belechi is reportedly a man of faith. 
According to the Monterey County Herald, he's a devout Christian, and that makes him something of an outlier among his fellow former Mythbusters. According to Skeptical Inquirer, Adam Savage thinks of himself as an atheist, freethinker, humanist, and yes, a skeptic. Meanwhile, in a 2014 Reddit Ask Me Anything, Jamie Heineman plainly stated that he doesn't think too highly of religion, writing that, Atheism or agnosticism or whatever movement doesn't affect me at all. I don't believe in anything. There are only probabilities, and the probability of a deity or some is pretty low. IMHO. Even Belaychi's close pal Carrie Byron has said, I am an atheist, but I don't begrudge anyone for whatever belief systems they hold. Tori Belaychi comes across as a pretty great guy on TV, and in real life, he seems to dial that kindness up to 11. The Monterey County Herald reports that Belaychi decided to take a trip abroad when Mythbusters took a brief hiatus in 2010. But instead of indulging in a luxurious holiday, he flew to Haiti to do some important volunteer work. Joining forces with the nonprofit organization Life Giving Force, Belaychi visited orphanages in the country in the aftermath of a catastrophic 7.0 earthquake on January 12, 2010. He helped local communities gain access to clean, safe water by building water cleaning systems. The little guys like this are getting clean water so they're not getting sick anymore. Belaychi was impressed by how the orphanages aimed to educate the kids. As he told the Monterey County Herald, one of the pastors said, if we can educate 5,000 to 6,000 kids over the years, these kids are going to grow up and you're going to have a whole generation of leaders. And that's what he was saying they need in order to change Haiti. He blows up things for kicks. He helps people in need. He's basically the perfect human. And that's no myth. The one accessory he always has with him and the reason for it. The explicit message he shared on social media. The surprising Hollywood job he booked. Here is what many don't know about Mythbusters co-host Jamie Heineman. You may only know Jamie Heineman as the grumbly half of the Mythbusters duo. There's a lot of stuff about him that doesn't fit his TV persona, but he's done some things that are very in line with the meticulous, analytical personality we all came to know through 13 years of Mythbusters. Heineman's special effects work wasn't so much his destiny as it was a conclusion he came to after many long hours in a library. He told StarWars.com, I figured I should think carefully about it and research my options. I made lists of interests and priorities, spent a lot of time in the library reading about anything that seemed like a possibility, and decided special effects was the way to go. While Jamie Heineman sometimes finds motivation in libraries, he wants the world to know that he also finds inspiration via exercise equipment, which is at least marginally more interesting than a library for an inventor. He told Udacity Talks that he believes the mind and the body really aren't so separate, so when he's trying to solve a design problem, he exercises. He revealed, The first thing I do is I get on a treadmill because I find that that mind-body connection is really important. Heinemann says science backs up the practice too. Increased oxygen levels and changes in body chemistry can help stimulate the mind, which can lead to ideas and problem solving. How about treadmills that give you ideas without making you exercise? Oh, that would be a million dollar invention. He's not quitting. Nope. Jamie Heineman is almost never seen without his signature beret, which makes him look sort of like a French mime. It left fans everywhere desperate to know the story behind the ubiquitous hat. The Mythbusters host told The Age, My hair was falling out, so I got in the habit of wearing a hat, and I didn't like baseball caps, so I got a beret. But the beret wasn't so much to cover up the hair loss as it was to cover up the shine of his scalp. He added, If my hair was going to fall out, I figured I might as well shave it, but if I shave it, I look like a cue ball. Heinemann figured he should balance out the shiny dome, even though it's always under the beret, with some facial hair. Hence, the handlebar mustache that completed the signature look that he maintained through pretty much every season of Mythbusters and beyond. Lots of people have great gadget ideas, but most of us lack the technical skills necessary to bring our visions to life. According to Popular Mechanics, Jamie Heineman invented and built the prototype of a remotely operated firefighting tank. The tank can carry 1,000 gallons of water and 100 gallons of flame retardant foam. It's covered with flame resistant fabric, the same material firefighting suits are lined with, and has high powered water guns that shoot wherever the operator is looking. It also self cools by spraying a mixture of glycerin and water over its internal components so it can survive driving right into a fire. The machine is apparently based on a non-armored M548 military cargo carrier, which you can get from your local army surplus store. Heinemann delivered the prototype to his financier in 2018, and with any luck, we'll see it start showing up to take on wildfires within the next few years. 
Jamie Heineman and his former co-host Adam Savage are big in Europe. Both have honorary doctorates from a university in the Netherlands, and Jamie Heineman is revered in Finland, with the Lute University of Finland naming a lab after him, the J. Heineman Center. According to the Helsinki Times, the lab is like the Mythbusters workshop. It exists so students can use it to build and test their creative ideas. The lab's name wasn't just a nod to Heinemann from his fans on the other side of the world. Heinemann also has an honorary doctorate from the university. And in 2021, the university made him a professor of practice, which is a non-tenured faculty position with a specific professional background. It's not just an honorary title, as Heinemann gives lectures and helps students with their projects. Shortly after accepting the position, Heinemann noted that he wasn't going to be setting any goals for his collaboration with the university, as the travel can be tough. All you have to do is watch Mythbusters to know that Jamie Heinemann has hands-on, practical experience at blowing things up. But as it turns out, all those years behind the detonator attracted the attention of some actual industry leaders, including the International Association of Bomb Technicians and Investigators. The association is a nonprofit that provides training to police, military, and others who have to detect and defuse bombs as a job function. The association and the Mythbusters go way back, too. The show had to consult pros for safety reasons whenever they were planning to make something go boom. It also helped to have some experts on hand so they didn't look completely unhinged. I think we got what we came for. Local bomb squads participated in around 20 Mythbusters episodes. In return, Heinemann and Savage were invited to speak at the 2008 International Training Conference Banquet, where they were both given plaques naming the two hosts honorary lifelong members of the association. Jamie Heinemann doesn't really seem to crave the spotlight, but he does love to do things that make a difference. Besides working on better PPE and a firefighting tank, he also worked with the military. But instead of making better weapons, Heinemann tested better ways to protect soldiers. According to Discovery News, the Office of Naval Research enlisted his help in 2011 to develop armor for military vehicles. The armor had to be lightweight enough that it wouldn't affect the vehicle's performance, but still capable of stopping shrapnel and protecting the vehicle's occupants from a blast. The military high-ups actually called Heinemann instead of the International Association of Bomb Technicians and Investigators for the job. It wasn't the first time Heinemann worked with the military. He also designed a robotic medical dummy for the Army to use while training new medics. The idea was to prepare medics for the real world of the battlefield. Some people are terrified of spiders. Others make entire movies about them starring live spider actors. The 1990 film Arachnophobia, for example, was made by the latter. The former probably never saw the flick. Unfortunately, there's really only so much you can do with live spiders on the set of a movie, as filming spiders usually involves just turning them loose and hoping they'll eventually scamper in the direction you need them to. For some scenes, you're going to need fake spiders. In the time before CGI, those fake spiders had to be animatronic. So where does one get an animatronic spider? Cue Jamie Heinemann. According to the Art Direction Handbook for Film, Heinemann was hired after he showed producers a magnetic spider he designed to crawl across a metal pan. The magnetic spider didn't get the role, but Heinemann got the job. This was before the inception of Mythbusters, when Heinemann was working in special effects and hadn't even made a name for himself yet. According to Den of Geek, the spider of Heinemann's that appeared in the movie was used as a sort of stunt spider and got all the close-ups. If you were a Mythbusters fan, you got to know the Mythbusters workshop intimately over the years. But unless you were a rabid fan who paid a whole lot of attention to small details, you might have also assumed it was a set. After all, isn't everything on television shot on a set? The Mythbusters workshop is actually a real place, the M5 Industries Lab. Jamie Heineman owns it and always has. According to Popular Mechanics, the South San Francisco workshop no longer has cameras in every corner, but some of the Mythbusters inventions are still there. Heineman still works there, only he's no longer surrounded by the Mythbusters crew. He sometimes even gives tours to the local kids. BattleBots seems like exactly the right side hustle for Jamie Heineman. And let's face it, pretty much anyone working on Mythbusters, the host spent a lot of time destroying the things he created. And that's exactly what BattleBots was. Part Mad Max, part Roman gladiators. Designers built robots, and then the robots tore each other apart for an audience. And the best part was that no one got hurt. According to Bishop Wisecarver Corporation, back in 1995, Heinemann built a BattleBots robot out of a lawnmower engine and a wok. He welded blades onto the outside of the wok, and put the whole thing on a spinning steel ring. The robot, dubbed Blendo, spun at 80 miles per hour, 
and won the few battles it was permitted to enter in just a couple of seconds, ending a fight that quickly maybe doesn't make a competition show enjoyable. Another issue with Blendo is that it was an insurance company's nightmare. Showrunners quickly decided that Blendo was a liability, and it was banned from competition for being too dangerous. Just because you can speak Russian doesn't necessarily mean you're Vladimir Putin's buddy. After Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, the rest of the world wasn't happy with Russia or its president's decision, least of all Jamie Heineman. On March 4, 2022, Ukraine's Twitter account shared a video of Jamie Heineman with the message, Jamie Heineman has something to say, and he asked us to share it with all of you. In the video, Heineman appears wearing his signature beret, and in Russian says, I have to tell you something, Russian warship, go f yourself. Then he switches to English and implores Russian soldiers to leave Ukraine. It looks like Heinemann's knowledge of curse words in the Russian language has its perks.